Okay, Boker Tov, we're continuing through our study of the Amidah. We're going to the next Beracha. We have two more Berachot left to complete the middle section of Bakashot, of requests that we have in our standard Amidah. The second to last of the requests is a request that kind of piggybacks off of yesterday's Beracha, talking about the Mashiach and the Davidic line, the Davidic dynasty. May the growth or the offshoot of David, your servant, speedily grow and expand. And may his pride, karno, literally the word karno means keren, is like a horn. But sometimes keren can also be a glow or pride or glory that a person emanates outward. Right, the word when Moshe Rabbeinu comes down from Har Sinai, it says Karan Or Panav, that his face beamed with light coming off of it like a horn, like a kitten. So Vikarno Tarum Bishuatecha, and may his pride, the pride of David, be raised high by your salvation. In other words, bring back the Davidic line and allow the family of David to occupy their rightful place as the leaders of the Jewish people. For we hope, that's kivinu, kivinu comes from the word tikva, like we call our national anthem, ha-tikva means our hope and our anticipation. For your salvation, we hope and wait and anticipate kol hayom, all day and every day. Baruch atah Hashem, blessed are you God, matzmiach keren yeshua, who makes the glory of salvation Flourish. In other words, it is from you that our Keren Yeshua, the glory of our salvation, will grow forth. So this, although it doesn't use the word Mashiach, this is essentially a Beracha for the ultimate salvation of the Jewish people and restoring the Davidic line and the Mashiach. And the Mashiach literally means anointed one. Limshoah means to anoint somebody. So because the kings and leaders used to be anointed by the special oil that was used in the Beit HaMikdash called the Shemir HaMishcha, the one who is the leader is called the anointed one, the Mashiach. That's where that word comes from. We're essentially asking God to restore the line of David HaMelech and his family, which is eventually called the bringing of the Mashiach through the salvation of Hashem. Now I think it's very nice that the are very appropriate that the rabbis use the imagery of the um, restoration of David's line with the word tzemach. So it's used, that's the key word of this beracha that's used at least three times. It's tzemach David, mehera tatzmiach, and then we say matzmiach keren yeshua. What does that shoresh, that root word mean? Tzemach, sadi mem het. Litzmoach. No, means to what? Flourish or grow. Plants are called, in Hebrew, tzmahim, things that grow, right? Now, what is the nature of growth? Growth, true growth, like that of plants and human beings, happens slowly, gradually, and over much time. So when a person plants a tree, it'll often be decades before they realize the true, ultimate growth of what that tree will become. In many cases, the Gemara tells a story of a man named Choni HaMe'agel. Choni HaMe'agel was Choni the circle maker, right? And he had a very famous story in which he saw a farmer planting a carob tree. And he went over to the farmer, he said, how long does it take for this carob tree to plant? He said, well, to grow, excuse me, to grow. He said, it takes 70 years for a carob tree to fully develop. So he said, I don't understand. You're already a middle-aged man planting a carob tree. Why are you planting uh, this tree that you yourself will never get to experience? So he answered Hani, he said, look around you at all of the carob trees and fruit trees that are here. They were planted by somebody else for me, and that person who planted them was not going to experience them, but I have benefited from that of work of those before me who they did not benefit from their own hand, from the labor of their hands. And so now I have a responsibility to pay it forward, to do as they did, 
to plan for something for the future that I may not necessarily experience, but my children or grandchildren will have the opportunity to experience. That's the nature of planting. The nature of planting requires foresight. It requires vision, where a person is going to do something that they know themselves they may not benefit from. And human nature is, I do things that I benefit from. But those who are the greatest of people are the ones who know how to see generations ahead to a greater purpose, to something beyond just themselves. And to say, I need to be, put in the dirty work, the hard work, the sacrifice, not for myself, but for my grandchild, that they should have a better world and a better place. And that's what the great visionaries of who built the state of Israel, who knew that they were going to go through wars and hardships and death and much sacrifice, did so that we as a generation can have a homeland to be able to go to. And therefore we have a responsibility to put in that effort as well to make sure that the homeland continues to grow and flourish for those to come. And that's why we have to constantly pray to Hashem. But my point being that the, the, the mashal, the, the comparison that the rabbis use here to the ge'ula, to the redemption being a plant, something that grows very slowly, is very appropriate and very important. Because sometimes, especially for us in the modern day where we want everything to be quick, everything has to be fast, instant gratification, we're kind of looking around saying, no, yalla, let's go, where, where, is the, where is the ge'ula? And it takes hundreds of years, it takes a tremendous amount of time. Baruch Hashem, we are feeling as though we are at the end of it, that we are the privileged generation who are watching more and more things come to fruition, but there is still much to be done and it may still take quite a bit of time. So we pray for HaKadosh Baruch Hu to restore the Davidic line, but we understand that it is something that is slow, that requires patience, but most importantly, like planting, requires a tremendous amount of sacrifice that we have to be willing and ready to maybe do not for our own sake, but for the sake of generations who are to come after us. So I think that's a value and an important uh, message that this beracha is very subtly sending to us as far as our relationship with our world and with the world that we want it to be in generations to come. Questions, thoughts? What's the, what's yeah. the latest we know who the, the line of David and what is the what is how far back can we trace who is from David Amelech? was he from David Amelech? It's it's noted that those rabbis who are leaders. Yeah. So there are some families in our community and in other places who have traditions. Who they have traditions similar to my family having a tradition that we're from Elia Cohen. We don't necessarily have a proof, but there are some the Hanono family, the Hanono Ben Dayan family have these traditions that they uh, that they emanate from David Melech. I'm not aware. I'm not sure myself how far back we can actually take it. It would seem that many of the prime ministers, the many of the presidents in the times of the Tanaim, like Hillel and others, were said to have been from the tr the, the family of David. Um, but it's not 100%. Uh, I, I don't know myself personally how far back you can necessarily, uh, necessarily bring that to. Um, okay, why don't we move to the final beracha as well. This is the last beracha of the section of request of Bakasha. And it's more of a general... Uh, concluding beracha, which we ask HaKashem to listen to our prayers. Uh, so you'll see the nature of its generality that's much different than the previous berachot. Each of the previous berachot, we kind of zeroed in on one particular thing that we're asking for. This beracha now is much more general, establishing that, we're, that we have a relationship with Hashem and we want Hashem to listen to our prayers. So we say, Shema kolenu Hashem elokenu. Listen to our voices, the Lord our God. Avhara Haman, Father of mercy and compassion, Hus Virahem Alenu, spare us and have compassion and mercy upon us. The Kabel Berahamim Uvratson etifilatenu, accept with mercy and compassion and divine will our prayers. Ki el Shomea Tefilot Vitahanonim Atta, for you are a God who listens to prayers and to supplications. Umilifanecha Malkenu, Rekam Al Tishibenu, do not turn us away, O our King empty-handed from your presence, uh, which is a nice play that we make over here, which is that the Torah requests of us on the three festivals, right, not to appear before God empty-handed, right? Lo yira'u fanai rekam. Do not come empty-handed when a person goes to visit the house of Hashem. Just like when a person would go to their neighbor's house or to a friend's house that they were invited to for Shabbat or for holiday, you always bring some kind of a gift, a bottle of wine, something to show your appreciation for them inviting you. 
the idea of going to the house of Hashem should not be taken for granted. So the Torah demands of us to, come, to not come empty-handed. And so then we take that idea and we say, okay, Hashem, we've come before you, not empty-handed. Do not send us away empty-handed and heed the requests and our prayers that we are offering before you. The Abu Danha mentions a nice point that what we're also hinting to over here is we're saying to Hashem, God, we may not be of merit. We may not be of the, of, of the high enough status that you're going to answer everything that we've asked of you right now today, that you'll take all of our requests. But at very least, through compassion and mercy and the merits of our forefathers, at least if you're not going to accept every aspect of our tefillah, accept some of it. Take one of the requests, a little bit of what it is, and accept that so that we don't, we don't go away empty-handed. In other words, we recognize you're not going to accept everything that we've said. We're not of merit to be able to have all of everything that we've requested taken by Hashem. But don't let us leave empty-handed. Give us something, at least from our prayer that we've offered, that we feel like we, we deserve, that, we, that we've come before you and out of your, out of your compassion. So that's a nice idea to sort of keep in the back of one's mind as you're saying those words. Don't leave us empty-handed. Be gracious to us. Honenu comes from the word hen to find favor in a person's eyes. Matzati chen ve'enecha. Honenu, be gracious to us, find favor in us. Va'anenu, and answer us. Ushma tefilatenu. And listen to our prayer. Ki ata shomea tefilat kol peh. For you listen to the prayers of all those who use their mouths. In other words, not just us, but other people as well. What are we bringing? He's saying to tefilah necessarily? Right, that's on the festivals. That's on the festivals. Maybe for us, on a daily basis, we come wearing our tefillin, we come with our mitzvot, we come to the house of Hashem. Um, it used to be we offered a sacrifice to God. That's what our tefillah... The tefillah itself is kind of what we're offering to a certain degree. But there is an idea that we should make sure to offer something to Hashem each day as a token of our appreciation and uh, for the fact that we have an audience with Him and hoping that that will merit us to be able to... Uh, to receive at least a, a portion of what it is that we're asking from in our prayers. Because you listen to the prayers of kol peh, of all those, of every mouth. Now that's an interesting line, because that means that we say to God, you're not only limited to the prayers of the Jewish people, but you listen to the prayers of all mankind, of all those who have tzelem and lokim, assuming that they are meritorious and their prayers are of, of value to you. But I saw a nice point that the Abu Darham brings in, he says, what is the gimatria, the numerical value of peh, of mouth? Ki shomea tefilat kol peh. He says the numerical value, peh is 80. So 85, 85. Peh is peh he, 85, no yud. Peh he is 85. He says 85 is the same numerical value as mila. Mila, mem yud lamid he. Mem is 40, yud is 10, it's 50. Lamid is 30, is 80, and He is 585. He says, what are we hinting to over here? You listen to the mouths of all those who have a Brit Milah. In other words, no matter what Jew it is, if you have a Brit Milah, Hashem will listen to you. And that's a very, I think it's a very nice idea. Why? Because what it's saying is, is that despite whatever a person's own personal observance might be, if they keep at base level to the fact that they identify with themselves as a Jew through their Brit Milah, Hashem will gain them access. They have uh, an acceptability to that. Huh? Yeah, that's true. But I think it's, you do a brit milah for the purposes of identifying yourself as a member of the Jewish people, right? So I think what we're saying here is, is that we hope that Hashem listens to the prayers of everybody, that Hashem responds to the prayers of everybody. And of course, the more merits a person has, the higher a level he is, the more likely a person is to have his requests heeded by God. But at the, very little, at the very least, we say that if somebody identifies as a Jew through the Brit Milah, he has a certain uh, pes. He has that credential that he can go in and ask from Hashem, and Hashem will heed at least a portion of his requests. Baruch atah Hashem, blessed that you God, Shomea Tefillah, who listens to prayer. So you understand, and it makes a lot, very, very good sense, why we should end off the request section with this type of a beracha. We've just sat there and requested a, a, a whole bunch of things from Hashem. So we sort of conclude and frame that section by saying to Hashem, please listen to us. We understand that it is not because of our merits 
that we have the right to ask from you or that you should listen to what it is. You are, through compassion and mercy, the God of all gods, and that's what we're trying to uh, elicit. We're trying to play on the fact that we're not worthy, but still, we need you, and if you can see your way clear to offer us at least a portion of our prayer in humility, um, that's what we need, because you listen to, to everybody's tefillot. I think that, that you, hear, you hear the humility in the words of the rabbis, and I think that's very important for us to, uh, to take into consideration. Um, I think it's important to understand that the Berachav Shema Koleno is very famous because being so general, there is an idea brought in the Halakha that if a person has any of their own personal requests that they wish to offer to Hashem that don't necessarily fit into any uh, neatly into any of the other prior Berachot, it would be that he should add this request in the blessing of Shema Koleno, being its general nature. Basically saying to Hashem, you listen to everybody's prayer no matter what they need. And there's something that I need personally that didn't fit with one of the requests that I mentioned prior. I'm going to offer that request over here in this beracha. So that's usually done right before we say, Ki ata shomea tefilat kol peh. Right before that, right before the beracha, if a person has something that they wish to insert, they may do so. In many of the newer sidurim, you'll find that there's a small prayer there for parnasa, for livelihood. Um, that people like to say, that a person is welcome to do that as well. Um, personally, I think a person, if they want to add that, it's fine, but I, I'm not so sure that it should, it should be added on a daily basis necessarily, then it just kind of becomes part of the standard text. I think this was something that maybe people added uh, periodically when they were in need of something a little bit more dire or something was going on in their business that they needed assistance on. There's nothing wrong with adding it daily, but personally, uh, my feeling is, is that I wouldn't add anything consistently daily to the tefillah that wasn't part of the original prayer that the rabbis had, it's, unless it's something that a person really needs in that, in that time and place. Everybody needs panasa. I knew you were going to say that, right? Everybody needs panasa all the time, right? Uh, so, okay, so I hear that. That is, that is a valid point. And so that's why I said if a person wishes to add it, that's fine as well. It's also worth noting that on fast days in this beracha, the individual adds in the extra prayer of anenu, answer us on this day of grief, on this day of fasting, um, we say to Hashem that you answer all the prayers, before we even call to you, you're already answering us and providing us with the, with the healing. And so um, it makes sense that the rabbis added this uh, little uh, insertion on fast days, the Anenu prayer, which talks about general acceptance of our Teshubah, into this Beracha, which talks about generally accepting um, our prayers uh, as a whole. Um, so I'll read to you Rabbi Sachs's point. He says, an all-inclusive player that our prayers be heard. At this point in the silent Amidah, the individual can include any of his or her personal requests. So that basically takes care of um, the section of Bakashot. Uh, moving forward, we're going to now transition into the final section of the Amidah, which is three blessings which talk about Hoda'a. Gratitude, thanks, and appreciation for having an audience with Hashem and for all of the things that He um, naturally does for us that we should not take for granted, that we should appreciate in the coming classes. We'll wrap up those benefits. Yeah. For, to, to accept your prayers after the Hodawat because you say thank you and then you ask for it. Um, I think that. I think the rabbis felt it was still a request that should be included amongst the request section. And then after one has fulfilled his request, including answer our prayers, he says, thank you for giving me the opportunity to even opportunity. stand before you. Yeah, I think that's what really we're asking for. The opportunity to even... I don't think that we're asking... I think that's a good point. I don't think that we're asking you, thank you Hashem for giving us everything. After all, he doesn't know what Hashem's going to give him. He just said, he just offered the tefillah. He's got to wait to see. The rabbis say not to do that, by the way. The Gemara talks heavily about that. That after a person has prayed, he should not... Look around his day to see, oh, did Hashem give me this? Did Hashem give me that? He should not wait to analyze and investigate if his prayer and request has come true. The rabbis say someone who does that, he'll lead him to depression, lead him to heartache. Why? Because it doesn't happen, right? It doesn't happen right away where a person prays to Hashem and right away he's answered, right? Usually it takes time. A person has to put in sacrifice. Sometimes it happens in subtle ways. You don't even notice it, right? So for a person to sit there and say, I need that, this thing, and then wait all day long for a person to get it, 
First of all, that's also very arrogant. That means that the person believes that his tefillah was enough, that he should immediately go ahead and get it. Hey, how come it's not coming to me? I asked for it, how come it's not there? Right? So you can see that we're trying to end off the request section in a state of humility. Despite us requesting from God, we don't take for granted that Hashem is going to give us our request, that we're deserving of Hashem giving us our request. We're not asking Hashem for a miracle. So whatever Hashem decides, it's in His hands. We've done our part. We've, we've humbled ourselves before Him. Whatever Hashem decides. So the thank you section of the tefillah is not thank you for answering the prayers that I'm just about to give because we don't know what's going to happen with that, nor should we really be investigating if that's the case. What we're really asking for is, what we're really saying thank you for is, Thank you for all of the things that I already have. Thank you for all of the things that you do on a consistent basis that we don't always notice. And thank you for giving me the audience, the ability to even approach the Almighty to ask for Him, which is not something that kings often give out with very ease, with a lot of ease. Do you want to elaborate that you shouldn't uh, ask for something daily? What I'm saying is, yeah. What what I'm saying is, is that I would not. It's not that I wouldn't ask. I wouldn't add in. They've they've composed a standardized prayer now for livelihood, which people are saying every single day. So my fear is that people are going to now start to take that as part of the standard amida. That since it's written in the books and we're saying it every day, it's now a staple of the amida. So I, that that I get hesitant in that. I get nervous because. We don't have the ability really so much to add things to, a, to, a, to, to the Amidat in a way that it makes it permanent or anything like that. So if a person feels the need to pray for Panasa and he wants to do that, just understand this was an additional prayer that was composed and put in if a person needs help articulating their individual needs for livelihood. If a person has something very specific, like they're going to a business meeting, they should phrase it that way. Hashem, help me in this meeting. Help me in this, uh, in this deal, in this negotiation that I'm doing. I'm dealing with a very hard client, somebody who's not being uh, receptive. Help, soften him, help him to understand the, the way. Help me with my business partners. This is something I tell people to pray for all the time. Person has business partners, sometimes they're not getting along. Forget about making money and doing it. In order for people to have a good business uh, environment, and to be successful in business, they have to get along with the people they work with. Pray to, 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 be, to get along with those people, that they should have a good relationship with each other, especially if one works with family, where that could be increasingly more complicated when people work with family. Um, they often get into fights and how they break up the business and you want your son in and blah, blah, blah. So we see that unfortunately around town quite a bit. Person should always pray for shalom, for peace within the, within the business so that the business can be able to flourish. So if you have an individual request, something that you want, and you're having a hard time articulating it, I'm perfectly fine. I think it's a good idea to use that. But also to articulate your own prayer, you could do it even in English. Don't be afraid to waffle between the Hebrew that you're reading and the English that you're inserting. It's fine as well. Um, I just I get hesitant and nervous when you add in a standard prayer to the Amidah that now people can start to think becomes... Uh, part of the Amidah. That's all, that's all I'm saying, yeah. But they, they, they added the 19th Berakha. But that was the Hachamim of once upon a time. The Hachamim of today, the authors of the Kol Yaakov, may their, uh, <laughs> their memory be blessed and are great people, don't have the power anymore to add in uh, actual prayers into well, the Amidah. Wrote, that's not, that's huh? not, it's a more... Right, I don't even know if they want... They, they would be happy with it necessarily. I don't know. I mean, it's been, it's been found. I've seen it in other Sidurim. Yeah, also stuff that they threw in there as well. The difference is at the end of the Amidah, I'm less worried because it's the end of the Amidah. The Amidah is over. When you're starting to stick it in permanently to the middle of the Amidah, I get a little bit more nervous.